Good afternoon. Um, welcome to Brighton. Um, if you haven't been to the wonderful city of uh, Brighton and Hove before, welcome. Um, and whatever you do uh, over the next three days, make sure you get some time to go out and see a bit of Brighton. There's a lot of it to see. Um, I'm delighted to be able to make a contribution to your conference. Um, it's a fascinating conference programme. And in all my career, in terms of working in change, um, but especially in higher education, I seem to be constantly in the process of implementing that student information system. <laughs> you know that feeling, obviously. I'm waiting to get to the point, and I'm hoping to do that in my current institution, where we've implemented the current the student information system. Um, I'm also, it's, it's, um, it's uh, I'm really delighted to make a contribution and to talk about the issue which is, I think, absolutely crucial to achieving what we all seek to do in higher education, which is about working with people and changing lives and shaping futures. But it's really interesting. I was trying to list the number of four-letter acronyms that were in the introduction. So I'm going to have to find out what a GDPR is and whether I need to worry about it. No. No, that's a no then, is it? All right, okay. Right. So, um, marvellous. Right. Uh, I'm going to use this period of time just to sort of um, introduce uh, a few themes. And you'll be way ahead of me because um, you're all fantastically digitally enabled people. I was going to ask an acid test question, which was just to illustrate how the world has changed. Whether, whether, whether anybody could ever sit through a, a half an hour lecture these days or a half an hour session and not touch their device. <laughs> you know, I travel on buses and trains and various mo modes. Of, but on buses and trains, everybody's got that. You know, the underground in London, everybody's got a one of those. And usually the headphones as well. And we're just in these isolated digital worlds in which if you don't, you know, what would you do? I don't know what would happen if I took the devices away from our students. They'd probably have to talk to each other. and That would be difficult. So my focus is going to be about looking at, um, looking at our, our digital world and the expectations that come with that because the expectations transfer from our, from our personal space into our public and, and um, engaged space. Um, I want to talk about data and systems and share with you my worries. And finally, just to, and to focus on how really to empower and engage people in change. Um, and I've taken quite a few change processes into organisations and uh, you learn fairly quickly what works and what doesn't work. So let me take you on. Um, in terms of our digital world, I just think it's extraordinary the pace of change. Um, if I use the example of big data, not so long ago we were just talking about data. Now we're talking about big data. Now we're looking at these data sets that can computationally reveal patterns about us that we didn't probably even know. Um, the trends and associations that go with that. You know, Amazon probably are the best exponents of this about how to use data to know about us more than we know about us. Uh, second followed only, I think in my case, by John Lewis. Um, how they've used data to look at human patterns of behaviour and interactions. And you begin to see that now in how health services, health and social care services are beginning to think about how data is used to shape patterns and interventions because we are going to have to get way smarter at using data. Um, I th there is both, I think, extraordinary potential in big data, but there is, uh, I see massive risks um, and the freedom with which people share their data, I think, is just, you know, all, all that sense of personal security increasingly trying to encourage people to be very careful. So every time I was at a shop recently and I bought something and they said, oh, could I have your, your, your address? And it's like, why do you need that? Well, it's just for our data set. And like, well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to give it to you. I don't have to. I just wanted to buy a battery or something. <laughs> Ridiculous. So big data, I think, has extraordinary potential, but I think there are real cautions. And as with all of these things, um, having worked with some big data people in the past, they'll get terribly excited about the amazing things that they can do. And there's some fundamental ethical and security questions I think we have to think about in that. 
Um, in 2014, the, the, the report um, from the Higher Education Commission, Bricks to Clicks, looked at the, the whole landscape in, in higher education in terms of data and analytics and barriers to implementing better data. Um, and they were really clear about the, you know, the acceleration that you, to be fair, are driving um, over the next five to ten years is just going to be, I think, going to grow at a pace that we probably can't quite get our heads around. And that power of analytics, that power of how this changes the way we deliver higher education. And good data management, for me, is absolutely crucial. Absolutely crucial. Uh, how that ownership and governance is seen. We've set up, I've been Vice Chancellor at the University of Brighton now, two weeks shy of a year. We've set up a whole data governance infrastructure because I worry about our data and how we manage it, about its security. So I have got clear, very clear leadership now over data governance and data champions. Um, ensuring that our data is accurate and consistent. Uh, the number of times we have to rework processes because we have to double check a data set that hadn't been necessarily... We'd, we're not yet at a point where we have a single source of truth which is absolutely validated on one occasion. Anybody got one of those? No, okay, that's fine. I, that feels better. Um, keeping that data secure as well. Um, all of those things where we have to go back and do double checks is just actually massive time-absorbing activity in an organisation where actually I quite like my academic colleagues to be focusing on our students and our research and our academic mission. The time, if, you, if I could calculate the amount of time that we spend double-checking data, it would be extraordinary. Um, all the controls about who can access data and who can't and how that gets in the way of processes and systems in the organisation. Um, creating a culture where people see data as an asset and curate it and care for it in that appropriate way. So all that capability amongst people to actually appreciate and understand the importance of data is, you know, Bricks and Clicks highlighted it. For me, it's very real. It's very every day. Um, we're about to uh, start a process just looking at business, business process review, so operational excellence, just going through and just refreshing and looking at how we do everything. And the pace at which data demands come upon us mean that we need to revisit processes on a regular basis because the processes that we used to run just aren't, either aren't agile enough or are far too leaky for the demands now being placed upon us. And then the Internet of Things. So, you know, I just find it amusing that, you know, you can get hacked by a toaster. It was toasters, isn't it? Toasters are compromising security because you've got a digitally enabled toaster. <laughs> I've clearly way lost it. Um, that expectation that people have in the world which is there where we love the Internet of Things, where we can connect everything, where you can just take your phone into your car and the hands-free immediately happens and your car talks to you and all those sorts of things or your other devices and and control your radiators from the other side of the planet. We like those things, but they bring another set of expectations and complications to thinking about, for me, the student experience or the staff member experience in terms of uh, higher education. And then we also know that in terms of the digital world, this acceleration and this complexity is growing hugely. This was um, a piece of work done, uh, this is from uh, Intel back in, uh, this is back in, this is the 2016 Internet Minute. A minute. In one minute, 1.3 million videos are viewed on YouTube. Yeah. 277,000 Facebook logins. That's not me because I've forgotten my password. You know, 200, 204 million emails a minute. And if they're not in your inbox, I think most of them come my way. It's just extraordinary the pace at which that's changing. And the, the generation who are coming through for whom this is increasingly the norm, this is their world. Was, I was um, 
I live in a little village and I was out doing some sort of community, we were cutting some grass or something like that and these two young guys um, walked past and I think must be 12 or 13 year olds or something, you know, in trousers down here and just ch- and they were walking along and they were talking about somebody and it was one of those conversations you think, oh, I remember that and they were talking about they had, somebody had posted something on Facebook and um, one of their friends had posted something and some, one of the guys was boasting, he was the first to like it he was the first, he'd liked it first and it's like, oh God. <laughs> but that's the generation for whom the environment that we create in higher education has to shift really dramatically uh, in terms of what they expect around that integrated, personalised student experience. I worry in all of this that we, the sheer volume means it becomes increasingly, increasingly difficult to separate the meaningful from just the sheer noise. You know, because you can send an email, you do. Uh, if I look at uh, YouTube as well, if you think about the, the educational resources on YouTube and various other sources and MOOCs and things, what does that mean for the model of higher education in the future? How can you access and get your, gain your higher education? What does that mean about uh, my lecturers who, who, you know, don't post even their slides on um, our virtual learning environment. Um, I also worry about this notion about academic integrity. So one of the vital parts of higher education is that we take somebody and give them a set of experiences and opportunities to take their thinking forward, to make their unique contribution at a range of different academic levels. And as things are just increasingly just sourced from the internet without necessarily discerning judgment or critical thinking, how do I know that I'm really enabling that person and stretching them in terms of their academic thought and discipline? And it becomes quite challenging. This was where I was going to ask you the acid test and sort of uh, ask you, you know, is there anybody tweeting as we speak? Is there anybody paying attention as we speak, as I speak? No. Oh, God, oh, God, for more hands. It's when you watch, there was a, you watch um, concerts and, and, and football matches and everybody views something through a screen. Extraordinary, extraordinary. So we have a generation who are digitally dependent. Um, you know, if I took their devices away, they would really struggle. And that's not going to change, I don't think. But it also opens up, our digital world opens up innovation ideas. Now, here's just a few. Um, I don't know whether you're aware of obelisk law. So obelisk law is basically lawyers, an online service from lawyers. So this notion of going to a chamber of solic- barristers or, or, or solicitors, um, no, you can source your legal advice online with the expert that you need who happens to be there and they work because they shift around and they're in different uh, time zones, you can work your legal problem 24-7. So that's a completely different, that's also been fantastically helpful for women in law to work flexibly, um, to, to get back into, to be in the workforce without necessarily having to be, you know, in an office. So there's a whole, you know, and if I, you know, I were looking at my legal advice in the institution thinking, Hmm. I could, I could outsource my legal advice to, to Obelisk. You know, do I want to do that? What's the model of legal advice? What does that mean for my students who are doing law and how they might practice and work in the future? And how do I integrate that into their thinking about how they might work and practice? Um, I find this other one really quite amusing, which is um, borrow my doggy. Has anybody seen that one? Yeah. You, have you walked a dog? Yes. <laughs> so you can now outsource and, and, and engage people in, in the, the health-giving benefits of walking your dog. You can borrow someone's dog and walk it for them. Good for the dog. Dog's probably exhausted at the end of the week. <laughs> Good for human interaction and that, that fantastically therapeutic thing which is, is communing with an animal, be it a dog, a cat, a rabbit or whatever. But there is a whole online service now in which you can um, borrow someone's dog and take it for a walk. And somebody's making money out of this. And dogs are getting exercised and doggy care costs are going down in other ways. So, you know, the internet, extraordinary, digital world. 
Um, this is, uh, at the bottom there is um, Penny Dodds, who's uh, one of my staff. Uh, she's a, a nurse, lecturer, practitioner. Been doing work with uh, uh, PODO, it's called the robotic seal. Uh, working with patients with dementia, uh, counteracting things such as giving people some interaction in terms of loneliness and dementia and having something to, to connect with. And you'll see an increasing rise. They took, so the Japanese took a robot into, up to the space station uh, using a, a very intelligent robot that was a, basically a friend to the Japanese astronaut, so had somebody else to speak to or um, commune with. That piece around how technology will transform, robotics will transform into types of care, delivery and service, we will see way more of. The work that's going on, as I say, with, with artificial pets is having a real impact, a positive impact, especially uh, say early work around support for dementia and loneliness. So, in our digital world then, we'll increasingly see the digitization of work. So will you ever physically come together again like this? Will you commune to your webinars and in every other ways? Um, there's an interesting report from the University of Oxford back in 2013 which caused a bit of a furore, which was about their, their work. They looked at the potential for um, advanced robotics um, and computing to replace jobs. And you'll have seen these reports repeated in other sectors. This one was particularly about the US, in which they suggested that about 45% um, of jobs in the US were at high risk of being taken over by computers. As the world becomes run by more complicated algorithms, running things such as the stock market, um, we will see more fields vulnerable uh, they're suggesting that things such as transport and logistics, um, uh, production, admin some administration jobs will increasingly become computerised, driven by algorithm, smart technologies. And what does that then mean about uh, work and patterns of work? Um, the next challenge in all of this, of course, will be the development of artificial intelligence, which will continue to change uh, the way computing works. The UK Commission on Employment and Skills as well looked at the future of work and the future of skills in 20, by 2030. An interesting report. So by 2020, that's what, um, four years away, 50% of the workforce are expected to be Generation Y and that's the generation that have grown up in a connected and mobile world. Uh, that wasn't me, I didn't grow up in that world, I'm trying hard to adapt. Um, but the, the, we'll also see, uh, we have a contradiction of having both highly skilled and technical people and different ways of delivering and yet in other areas, significant skill shortages. Um, the workforce in terms of demography as well, as we see the, demo the demography change, we're all going to have to be working longer. It's reassuring, isn't it? Um, we don't see that the population, the, a, the young population, the under 18s, are still continuing to decline until 2021. So we're all going to be in the workforce longer. The need to adapt and absorb and take on technology will become increasing, will increase. And the disruptive element of digital work will also change the nature of organisations and structures and governance. So there are some really interesting implications in here, not just for... Not just for my, our sector, higher education, but for a whole range of organisations. This is what I worry about. So this is an illustration from the um, OECD looking at global risks. I worry about data. I worry about cyber security. I worry about uh, cyber terrorism. I worry about individuals who give their data away with a degree of freedom which is slightly worrying. Um, I worry about data protection and standards. I worry about the physical infrastructure. So, um, one of my previous roles, when I was working at the University of Southampton, we had a fairly spectacular fire which took out a whole load of um, servers. And it was interesting, it was only that massive fire in, in um, computer science that took out the servers that actually led, led to the question to say, 
Why have we got only one data center? Do you think we should have two? Um, so that piece around the vulnerability that we have organizationally and yet at the same time the need to actually ensure that we've got secure infrastructure. Um, I worry about high performance computing and having sufficient access, sufficient access to that but also having that enough capacity um, to support my colleagues to do their research. Um, the other element that comes up for me as well in all of this is the notion around the cloud and the various jurisdictions that apply to those things stored on the cloud and where they're owned and where they belong. Um, you know, we have, uh, my previous institution, we would never support the use of, I've forgotten what it's called now, a particular data holding repository system that everybody ubiquitously uses, but we would never because there were real concerns that the data was held offshore and so actually because that was a lot of our research data that our provenance and governance and laws wouldn't apply to it. And that does worry people. So back to the everyday. You'll recognize these organizations. Um, the incredible importance and power of data and information and everybody's thirst for it um, is illustrated by, this is just, I think in the last week, I've had data requests from all of these. All of these terms, all of these bodies, um, I have just almost daily requests from, I signed off the HESA staff return last week. Yeah, my member of staff in HR printed it out. So that, that bit. Um, the requests for data are just extraordinary. Um, on, on such a regular basis and, and when you're not, when you're having to do all that checking and validating and then somebody wants it just five degrees different from that which you already have it in and then you have to redo it all and it's just extraordinary. I think the power and importance of data and the effective operation of higher education is becoming way more important. The demands are just increasing. We'll get another set of demands with the new structures that the government will put in place through the Higher Education Research Bill. I'm fairly confident. Uh, there'll be another set of information that people would like to have. My fear, both as a researcher and as a, in my current role, is that, that piece that, somebody, that you'll always hear someone with just another interesting question. Just put another question in there, just one more bit of data that we'd like. My challenge back is always, if you don't use it, don't ask for it. So can you illustrate to me where all this is really used in a meaningful way? It's the, exactly the same as the discipline of research. You know, if you're going to take someone's data, you must really know why you're taking it, what you're doing with it, and what you tell them what you've done with it. Um, if all of this was helping to enhance the effectiveness of the organisation and the student experience, that would be fantastic. I'm not always entirely sure that it is. Enabling individuals to focus their time on the most rewarding and important things in, in higher education, namely our students, our research, our enterprise, our external endeavours, for me is really important. So streamlining these processes is vital. Um, students are increasingly also wanting to be able to access all that they can through, uh, through their devices. So I'm back to my point about having single sources of truth, about data integrity, about accurate data stored and with clear privacy. But I don't see the external demands diminishing in any way. Uh, my worry is equally that sources of data that were requested are now being used for uh, means for which they were not originally intended. So um, I'll give you the example of the National Student Survey in the Teaching Excellence Framework. The National Student Survey was never designed to do what it's now being used to do. But there we are. Um, so now I come to the important piece which I think is, is at the heart of this. This is why it's all about people. You will all know in the processes and systems that you have to oversee or take forward that it's fundamentally about these illogical, irrational, emotional things called human beings who can do things for the most obscure and unpredictable reasons because we can, because we're human. Um, 
for me what's really important is that you think, you know, think of this is, this is um, uh, from, about, uh, from Preston and, and Greenhouse, is about complexity theory. But that's not why there's a shark in the picture. Um, systems and processes and systems of change are all about agents who are free to act in unpredictable ways. I'm sure you've all in your own way done something fairly unpredictable on occasions. Um, and these, it's the interactions and the agents' actions that change the context of each other. So for me what that says is how do you bring the talents and the genius of people together and liberate that in such a way that you move forward with your strategic intent, your strategic objective, that you make the change. Um, I have huge amounts of talent in my organisation. My job as the, uh, as the Vice Chancellor, or increasingly as I like to see myself, as sort of my job is the Chief Enabling Officer. It's not about me. It's about having set a strategy. It's about using the talents of people in the organisation to take forward great ideas. So we have challenges, every institution has challenges, but actually using the talent of the people in the organisation, once offered the opportunity to contribute, my experience is people have got just some really great ideas. And even if it seems really wacky, sometimes you really have to test yourself with the wacky idea. Because who knows, that might be the genius idea. The mental models and rules uh, which independent, operate, independent agents operate are not fixed. We help define them. So the mental model, that view, that schema that we create in which people in our organisations can think about change, we all have an opportunity to shape that. So creating conditions that enable people to get engaged, creating conditions that give them permission to say the emperor has no clothes is really important. You know, the, 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 uh, the, the person who, who will rightly tell you that actually it's all lovely and shiny, but you know, it just doesn't work, is probably your best friend. That ability to create conditions in an organisation that allow meaningful critique without that turning into just objective cynicism and um, destruction. I would um, urge you to, if you, if you haven't already, I keep going back to the words of P P Peter Senge and the notion of mastery, mental models, shared vision, all those elements about how you take people on a journey and how they help shape that journey. Um, Mark talks about, and, and actually I'm passionately interested in your PhD in terms of the implementation of timetabling. Oh, right, oh, you're, you're, so, um, um, Oh, right, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll swap your mind any time you like. Because timetabling now, is, if anybody has a, a, an answer to timetabling, please see me after. <laughs> yeah, no, clearly not, good. That's an, another shared challenge then. Um, I, again, theoretically, putting some theory into how you think about change for me is incredibly important. Uh, you know, the oft-used expression, there is nothing more useful than good theory. Um, and for me, Emmett Rogers' work on the diffusion of innovation, regardless of the type of challenge and change that, or process that I take forward, I always seem to end up coming back to Rogers' work. So his, his, he, he set out to explain the rate at which um, technological ideas were diffused. He, he did his early work in the 60s with um, Midwestern farmers in the US. Um, and he's a, he was a professor of communication studies, not change or anything like that. Um, and there are the elements in terms of thinking through the process about the innovators, the early adopters, uh, the, late, the early majority, the late majority and the laggards. You know. there, are, there is a distribution curve in that. No matter what change process you look at, you will be able to identify, you're probably doing that as we speak, in your head the people who you would put in various categories. And people will be in those categories for a range of reasons. Laggard doesn't mean not interested and slow and don't want to get involved. It just means probably more comfortable in their current skin, less challenging, more fixed in their term of, of practice. So my, my approach to using Rogers in terms of a change process is, um, is really backing the early adopters, the innovators and the early adopters. 
You have to use the tactics and the strategies that you have before you if you want to facilitate change to reward and recognise the behaviour that you're seeking to see, the change that you're have, seeking to see. My experience with people who are, if you're taking through a change process, there will always be some for whom this, you know, hell will freeze over before they adopt this form of technology. And I'm not putting my slides on the BLE. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, you've heard that one as well, haven't you? So my, personally, and I'm always really clear about this, my, my approach is I'm not going to embarrass you. I have a limited amount of energy and time. We all do. And I'm going to focus it where I'm going to get the most effective um, change. So I'm going to focus it around the early adopters and the late majority, helping people come along and get on board. The innovators will just, will just drive the energy process themselves. What I'm not going to do is spend my time trying to convince somebody who doesn't want to do this and doesn't see the purpose and actually will relish me having to try and persuade them and will probably go slightly further, further away anyway. But what I won't then as we shift the curve about what becomes the norm, for example, um, putting your presentations on the BLE, as that norm shifts, when that person arrives, you never embarrass them, and when they tell you it was their own best idea, you absolutely agree. This is, funda this is just fundamental stuff about human beings. People want to be in a group, they want to be supported, they want to be part of that. People don't naturally like being on the outside, especially because we're all in tribes and groups. So you have to allow people a time and a space and a place by which to come back into the group. If they're not going to, if they don't ever want to adopt a particular change, you have to think about where you spend your time and effort to best effect for the organisation. And again, I go back to this. It's, for me, it's the early adopters, the early majority. And we don't all move at the same pace. And the complexity of some of the changes that we ask people to take sometimes are, are really challenging. So this notion of, so my, my experience from clinical practice would tell me that, well, from, any, from your own professional practice, tells me people invest a huge amount in their sense of identity about who they are and what they do. And they define themselves very much about um, their work and their role and their contribution. And challenging that and changing that has to be done carefully. Because you're, in, in many cases you're challenging a person's identity or sense of self. And so that takes care and time in the context of a very fast-moving digital world. So um, I would always suggest, if you haven't, have a look at Rogers, see if you'd find it useful. He sets out the notion of it, the whole process relies really heavily on this concept of investing in human capital, you know, the power of people, the ability of people. Um, and I find it, um, I keep seeing this pattern repeating, which is probably why theory works. So empowering and engaging people in change is the job of all of us. In terms of leadership and enabling change, uh, you are all leaders. Uh, I keep telling people in my organisation, uh, we, we launched our new strategy about three weeks ago. had about 160 people um, in a room and uh, so the 160 top leaders in the, in, the, in the university. And we talked through the strategy and the various elements of it and... Um, made sure everybody knew that they were, they were a leader. I was talking to a professor afterwards, um, fantastic, amazing professor, said, I've never been referred to as a leader. So let me just reiterate, you're all leaders. We all take responsibility. It's not about seniority. Leadership is about the ability to lead and take people on a journey, to set out a vision and take people on that journey. So you are all leaders. How you engage staff in that process, the behaviour that you exhibit, how that influences and enables them to see a contribution to the organisation moving forward is really important. Allowing them to take the credit for the things that they've changed, no matter how small you think it might be, for people who've stepped up for the first time and put their head above the parapet and done something, they'll feel really engaged. As we take forward the strategy at the university, 
we're going to have um, a complete, there'll be there's a whole website, which is everybody who's involved in a particular project or element of the strategic implementation, it's all about them. It's not about the hierarchy. You know, I can, we can sit behind the scene. It's about empowering and enabling and showing off the talents of our staff. Um, so it's really important, I think, in terms of your leadership that you illustrate how you lead change as opposed to the change is you and everybody's allowed to come with you. It's how do you bring the next generation through. I think it's really important to have a clear strategic focus. What will it look like in the end? Where are you trying to get to? Can you describe it? Um, because without that sense of what is it, what's it going to be, it's very difficult. You dissipate energy because everybody is trying to be all things as opposed to that's where we're trying to be. Um, social media is absolutely crucial in all this. Still tweeting? Okay. Um, I'm still trying to work out how to work WhatsApp, but don't worry about that. I'll stick to Twitter, that's about all I can do. But social media in the digital world is absolutely the new norm. So we, again, we did, um, we did a launch of the, uh, the launch of the strategy, we were doing questions and we used Slido. Worked like a dream. Nobody, most people had never used it before. Suddenly we could all see the questions, people were talking to each other. I mean, literally, I've just been in a meeting. Yeah, I've been in a meeting and we've had some somebody talking, a legal expert, talking about health and safety and I'm just looking at my phone and I know that the professor over there across the table has just sent me an email about something else. I'm going, I'm not going to respond, Phil, because I'm supposed to be paying attention to this. But that's the distracting social media world that there is. So how do you use that media to connect with the generation that you want to connect with? We just, we just agreed that we're going to text our students. How about that? Um, <laughs> I know, but we're not rushing into these things, as you can <laughs> see. You know, being thoughtful and careful. Uh, and most of these, to be fair, I don't know what half of those are anyway. Um, but those, and, and the apps just develop almost a, a life of their own, and, and you know, there are people communicating, as you know, in different worlds. But me, social media is the new norm. It's also the new catch out. So. Um, We've recently, I've had to take through a process to make a really difficult decision in the institution, uh, which led to some really, uh, really stark reaction. Uh, personally, getting a video of my head being photoshopped into a jihadi decapitating someone by one of my students was not one of the best moments in life. So I've got a real sense of the downside of social media. Um, and it can be really abusive. Um, and I think I know what that feels like now. And, you know, if you put yourself out there, then you have to take what goes with it. But um, social media, it seems to me, is a platform that, in terms of change, using all of these techniques, not just we'll, we'll send you a, you know, there'll be a vice-chancellor email sent out to everybody's email box, because most of those group emails are both mostly put to trash, it seems to me. The other piece about enabling engaging people in change is about the analytics and the action. Um, an analytics-driven approach. Learning analytics are going to be uh, incredible, are, are already incredibly important. I think they will become more so, especially as we see the TEF moving forward and we see it driving down into subject-based levels. Um, so that analytic capability, that ability to deliver that feedback, and I know there are some institutions, I look with envy at, at uh, Nottingham Trent. Anybody from Nottingham Trent? Yay. So I look with envy at Nottingham Trent's analytics in terms of the feedback that students get about their progress, about their process, about the resources. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, and that's just what they're going to expect. If you look at what young kids get in schools, it's the norm. I was talking to a colleague who has a 12-year-old um, and was saying, so there was some, some issue with this 12-year-old and, and uh, so my, my colleague said to me, well, I've been on the web and I've checked his behaviour metrics. <laughs> Do you know, who'd be a teacher? You've got to they have behaviour metrics every week, apparently. I think we used to just get stars when I was a kid. <laughs> anyway, so that's, that's the data world that, you know, <coughs> mum and dad can now check your behaviour metrics on the, web, the school website. Has anybody checked their kids' behaviour metrics? Mm -hmm. See? I don't think we want to introduce that in university land. 
Um, so that, that analytics leading to action, so the more you take the data, the more you do the analys analysis, is going to then have a consequence about, so what have you done with it? You know, what's the so what question? You've taken my data, what are you going to do with it? So in some ways that becomes a, a fuel for the system of how do you make change? And that, I think, is just a pace that will just continue to grow. Um, as I said, I see you all as leaders in making change. You know you are. And you all have the power to take forward change processes that enable people to feel comfortable about coming and getting involved. If someone puts their head above the parapet, value, treasure that. Uh, they don't all have to, and sometimes that's a difficult thing for people to do in some organisations. And you'll find, in my experience, you'll find an incredible font of talent. You know, universities are full of incredibly bright people all across the institution. That's why we're in universities, all with extraordinary ideas. How do we use and funnel those ideas and that energy to best effect to deliver the strategic ambitions of the university and to help shape the futures of our students and our staff? Um, I just want to say thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. I'm not sure I would have, um, not sure I've imparted any huge wisdom that you don't already know but at least you know I tweet now. Thank you. <laughs> Some questions? Question, uh, Deborah, we've reached a, a stage, it seems, where IT can do most things. And we used to ask in the past, can we do this with IT? And IT can do most things. The question seems to be now, what is it we, we need to do? Uh, and that brings different barriers. I was thinking about some of the policy barriers, maybe related to security or ethics or different uh, stakeholder groups' attitudes to things. We're undertaking a, a massive lecture recording. Uh, program at the moment and there seems to be quite a lot of concern uh, around that and I wondered what you think some of these important barriers are and how we might overcome them. Um, I mean lecture capture is a really, really interesting example. So my previous institution we introduced lecture capture and the fear and anxiety about it was, was, was palpable. Um, the way we really made, pro because there were, and then we had all, this, all the issues about IP and about copyright and performance rights. It seems to me you only need to do that once and then you just you know, cut and paste and share it with every university because it's the law of the land. But there was real concern amongst some of the lecturers about how their materials would be abused or would the students then download them and put them on the general web as opposed to being in the... So, so where do you trust your students? Where do you make the rules and expectations clear about the system? Um, my, my comment back to student, the staff who were, you know, you can be recorded on these high quality webcams, uh, these high quality cameras that we've installed at great expense. Um, would you rather do that? Well, actually, you cannot police with, with digital technology these days. How can, I, how, can I, how can you police that somebody isn't periscoping you already? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit, bit of a nonsense, really, because many students would sit there and just film it with their phones. So this notion that suddenly we're going to put a sense of control around it, I get the IP piece and the worry about that, but I think that, you know, the, the genie's out of the bottle on that one. Okay, thank you. Mike is roving. Ian Little from Brunel University London. Um, very pleased to hear what you've been saying today. Uh, for my sins, I'm managing an organisational change at the moment. And one thing that I've found with some of um, the people who have had almost an excess of birthdays as I have, is that the move into more and more automated, more and more algorithmic, is creating um, atomization in people. How does this 
affect the way that we, as we're supposed to be leading here, as we're supposed to be managing here, how do we lead that change out of atomization? It's great to be able to work from home, and some people won't, will want to do it all the time. Some people will want to do it in the office while everyone else is working home. Where does this atomization lead us? And I think if you, t if you take the example of something like um, Obelisk Law, where you know, there isn't an office, uh, if I take the, I mean, the, the current campaign that's being run by uh, UCU about the real concern about casualization, actually that's about flexible working, that's about people actually selective, uh, there are people who are, there are clearly some that aren't, but there are people who are choosing to work part-time, who are adopting more portfolio careers. Um, if I look at the generation coming through, even if I talk to some of our medical students, they might train to do medicine, they'll do that for a few years, they don't want to be a medic all their life, which is again a bit worrying, but um, I just, it's the whole fragmentation of work and work life. So equally, people who actually do want to have a, a, you know, a bit more of a quality of life don't want to spend their entire life in the office doing things. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure how we deal with that. Uh, we've had a, a conversation recently about flexible working, and it's fine, you can be flexible, but when you then... We, introduce, we have a policy of flexible working, but you still have to run the core business, still has to be someone seeing students, and then when a member of staff wants flexible working but it doesn't meet the requirements of the, um, the, the, the university and the service, um, then we get, you know, we, we've had a bit, there's been a bit of a reaction to that. It's, like, it's not entitlement to flexible working. Um, there has to be a service and you have to be clear about that, whether that's core hours or various things. But I just think we'll see more of that. Um, and you can bring in your, you know, my, um, my sister-in-law used to work for a, a major bank and, and worked in the London headquarters and was involved in all their edit reports and various things. And they had a branch in Hong Kong and a branch in Los Angeles. And they worked problems 24-7. You just use the time zones. And so you could get a report done, edited, back, rewritten in 24 hours because you just use the time zones in a global in a global cycle i don't know that somebody doesn't access their you know where am i getting my it support from somebody could be doing supporting my sharepoint site from the other side of the planet so i'm i'm not entirely sure that we can that's ever going to be resolvable again faced with the old traditions and patterns of work You can probably just speak it, can't you? <laughs> Mike's arrived. Hi, um, my name is Richard from Loughborough University. Um, I must say I really enjoyed um, your talk this afternoon. You're very kind. I should be in Loughborough next week. <laughs> <laughs> um, your emphasis on data and how much data is being collected and more data is being collected. I'm just wondering what's your view on the emphasis on getting the data, rather than getting the data, um, the, the emphasis on making sure that the, we sh well, certain places show the correct data and get this right results. So it could be some manipulating the data to get the results, if you get me. Yes. Um, I think my first concern is about going back to the multiple agencies that ask for data and, and on, a, on a sort of almost daily basis. Um, is I would like to be in a place where we have an integrated system, IT system. If anybody who you know, anybody who's got this, please let me know. Um, an integrated system, so we have a single source of truth. So I know when it says that's a, an FEC, uh, when I, that says that's a full-time equivalent, it's a full-time equivalent. Uh, there's not various, I mean, all the nomenclatures of different definitions and languages that, the, that various agencies ask for. All it does is create, you know, that's fine for HESA, that's fine for HEFKE and the Department for Education and various things, but could you just all, could, if, if we could have an integrated data set, it would be so much easier with definitions. Let's collect it once, let's collect it, proper it properly and make sure it's valid and then use it. Um, what, what worries me is the time and effort that we spend. I was talking to one of my heads of school only this morning and we're trying to streamline how the work that heads of school do so that they can spend their time being academic leaders, not 
data checkers or handing it down to somebody else to data check. That, and that comes from actually ask the right questions in the first place, gather the stuff properly and why, you know, is there not a way in which we can use what we already hold as opposed to going and asking another set of questions to check this data? Yeah, uh, and I, 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 I can't, I don't see how that's going to, I don't see how that's going to go away. It worries me the, say, the ease with which people, you know, used to, we used to treasure privacy or used to have a regard for privacy and now once it's gone, I'm, I am the one who goes through and finds the box to check and reads the statement about whether it's a neg you know, an affirmation or, or not to tick the box to go, no, you can't give my data to somebody else. And no, I don't want another email, thank you very much. But um, there are way too many people, I think, who just don't do that. And the whole world knows about them. Hi, my name is Jake from the University of Liverpool. It's very nice to hear a VC talk about data governance, because if you think it drives academics mad, it drives IT people just as mad as well. But my question is about... Um, people being disadvantaged by change in an organization. So we're currently going through a student records implementation. And <laughs> we're, we're already hearing people saying, my bit works fine, please don't change it. So how, how do we combat that? So uh, data governance, uh, one of the first things I did was set up a data governance group because um, that was something to do with the fact that we didn't do too well in the key information set audit when I arrived. And we're okay now but it was basically a data management issue, so we need to have oversight. And this, as I say, this will just become more of an issue. In terms of people going, in my experience with change, you talk to everybody about, well, so we're going to move from here to there. Oh, that's fine, yeah, that's fine. Uh, as long as there looks like them, that's fine. It's, well, it might be, you know, we, we're going to go over there, but it might be sort of just six degrees from where you are. Oh, wow, no, well, I, we're, we're okay, we're fine. Uh, one, of the real one of the reasons why we're, going, we're implementing now this uh, a systematic approach to looking at business system process review, the as is and the to be, and the whole joy of Visio and all that sort of stuff, is actually the, using the most powerful technology on earth for this, which is the pen and the post-it note. And getting people... My previous institution, we did a similar thing, and there was this most wonderful woman. Anybody from Imperial College here? Oh, good. That's right. I can speak about them. Um, <laughs> so there was this wonderful woman, Sheila, in finance, who was sort of head of student finance something. Sheila had worked there for years, and she knew all the wrinkles in the system. When, we bought, when they used the operational excellence framework and got people to do business system process review, it was almost like Sheila had been desperate to get the pen and the post-it note. And they did this mapping exercise, which is, then we do this, then we do that handoff, and then we do that. Da, 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 da. Forget the IT, leave the box over there. Just do this process, mapping stuff. Um, she was just utterly liberated by it and just brought out all the things she knew that we needed to improve for students. She transformed the experience for students. She questioned fundamental things about, well, why do we charge interest on this? Why do we do this on late payments? All those sorts of things. And there was nowhere to go because Sheila's argument was compelling. And we took a whole series of changes to which are utterly down to Sheila and her team that have improved things for students. And that was about, that was just about liberating Giving, giving a methodology and a framework in terms of business process review, operational excellence, and a pen and a post-it note, and giving them organisational permission to do that change process. Now, and that's one of the things I want to do in Brighton, is you build the capability in your staff, because that's about developing them, that's about it's good for their CV, it's about capacity in the organisation, and it means that somebody, say, works over in health sciences and does this, who will have a health science view of the world but can go over and work with the mechanical engineers and just ask the simple question about, but why do we do it this way? Mm, I don't understand. What's it for? And when you see... You do, I, well, it's, well, we've always done it this way. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, but that's why. So I think you have to create that sort of climate, which is just, we're all right, fine, go away. It's find 
a framework and a methodology to get people to question practice. Talk to Sheila at Imperial in finance. Hello, I'm Mary from Sheffield Hallam. I was one of those people on the train reading my phone this morning. Um, <laughs> A, a, an, an article on the BBC news website that really caught my eye um, had the title of Shouldn't Lectures Be Obsolete By Now? I don't know if you read it. Um, uh, the university lecture has survived despite claims that technology would make it redundant. Now I know this is a huge topic but in light of what you're saying about technology and change I just wanted to know a, a few sort of comments of your view about this. Yeah, I mean, for me, education is uh, education is a it's it's all about humans. It's about these irrational, illogical uh, human beings who do things and learn in different ways. And the interaction for me, what's really compelling about universities is we create conditions and create a, a community and bring people together and create conditions to enable them to do hopefully the very best they can with where they want to go. I don't think that you know we're social beings so I don't sh I'm not entirely sure that we could ever replace the quality of education and interaction and dialogue and challenge by watching a video online um, the generation coming through for whom the world is about Khan Academy and much more interactive and you know I think they would they clearly take more easily to that but you know I'm one of those old-fashioned people who says you know actually I think sitting in a seminar and having a debate about ideas and challenging ideas and doing that in real time face to face is there's something really quite compelling about that but what that what that item also says on the BBC is about the level of attendance at the start and the level of attendance at the end and that actually is an issue about academic quality um, that for me is down to academic standards and there's, there's, always the, there's always the pushback that you know actually what you have to be is more of an entertainer than, a, than an educator. I think if you're able to prevent, uh, present a compelling case about your academic vision and people know why they're your academic subject and people know why they're in the room, you can make research methods incredibly exciting and engaging. See and change is important, but that takes us full circle. In the end, it really is all about people. So, I say thank you very much to Professor. Thank you.